My name is Professor Joseph Wunderlich and I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. And this is a lecture on uh, the shell, which is also an envelope of the building in both the architectural and engineering aspects of that. A uh, number of references here I won't go through, plus my experience. Uh, you can come back and take a look through all that if you like. I'll just start out with the basic concepts of the shell of the building. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, speaking of form, and, uh, purpose, and the spiritual realm of it. Uh, and that form and function are one thing, so I want to speak of the architecture and the engineering as one, one cooperative thing. This is from a lecture series I have on Frank Lloyd Wright, and you can uh, take a look at that sometime later if you like. Think of the influences on Frank Lloyd Wright, the geometric blocks, his Unitarian uh, belief system from his mother's uh, strong influence, also the Asian influence on him through a number of things, and his father who's a teacher, musician, uh, amongst other things, and the fact that he grew up in farmland. So the shell, um, solid forms and spatial voids, foreground and background interlock to form a unified whole. So what you're looking at is a mixture of the voids and the solid. This is a typical architectural studio project in early on in classes where you use a cube of volume and you define the space within. So cubic forms, uh, this is Frank Lloyd Wright's Unitarian Church in Oak Park. Um, on my YouTube channel, I have a, a hour and 20 minute video of 31 sites around uh, in and around Chicago, including uh, some nice footage of Unity Temple. Triangular shapes. This is his home and studio. Here is a, a later Frank Lloyd Wright site from uh, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Strong triangular shapes. This is me. Also in uh, Phoenix, Arizona is uh, uh, Taliesin West. Uh, Taliesin was his main home in Madison, Wisconsin. Then later on in life, he opened up Taliesin West, uh, which is, is still an operating school. Uh, they spend six months in Madison and then six months here, the entire faculty and students, staff. We learned quite a bit about the Frank Lloyd Wright Fellowship and uh, this community that lived and worked together here and learned and created for many years and still does long after Frank Lloyd Wright's passing away. There's an excellent tour guide we had. This tour guide taught us all about the culture that was there of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and his wife, Olga, uh, that uh, ran the, the college or the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Architecture School uh, Fellowship for tr over 20 years after Frank Lloyd Wright passed away uh, and how the students would uh, take care of the place and some of them still uh, a couple lived there for, uh, even afterwards. Um, so it's, it's a community uh, culture as well as a school and it still exists. Uh, we got to see uh, inside the uh, studio for the students. Um, this is my son talking to the female students sitting there. And then uh, the uh, staff were uh, trying, 
hoping to recruit my son into a graduate program. They gave us an extra tour beyond the regular tour behind the scenes and in the residential area. Uh, they live out in the camp. They, uh, there's a story behind that. They, the students each make their own uh, dwelling in the desert. So now circular, circular forms. So this is about the shell, the building, basic shell. Uh, so a strong geometric form there. This is a Orthodox church in Wisconsin, 1956. Uh, Guggenheim, a couple years later. This was actually his last uh, commission work. It didn't get completed. He passed away um, at 91 while it was being built. Uh, this is back in Arizona now. Um, the Gamage Auditorium, very circular. You can see that in the shell. Carries that circular theme throughout. Interesting how the brickwork is on this particular building. You can see it in the background there. This is another Arizona and uh, Phoenix uh, project design home circular shell. This is his son's uh, design, or it was for his son, um, and uh, it's up for sale again. It was going to be part of the the. Frank Lloyd Wright Trust and be used by the Frank Lloyd Wright School. Uh, that fell through. The neighbors stopped it. They thought there'd be uh, too many tourists in the area. Now it's back up for sale. And you can see from the aerial Google map there the circular nature of it. You get a feel for looking at it, uh, the elevation too, but from above you can really see the circular aspect. Uh, now circle and square shell. This is in uh, this is Windsor Castle, House of Windsor, Elizabeth Windsor, Queen Elizabeth, um, near right near Heathrow Airport. Uh, my son and I visited this in 2014. Circle and square. We dressed up a little bit to visit. Hexagon. These are uh, a couple of his bootleg projects. And there's a long story there that you can listen to my Frank Lloyd Wright lectures, what that means, bootleg, how he got in trouble, what happened in the relationship with Louis Sullivan, how Louis Sullivan seems to have possibly known about this. Uh, honeycomb House, Hexagon, it's everywhere. See it. Well, this is a project I did when I was 16 years old, a regional design competition for municipal building, hexagonal theme. Trapezoidal. This was the first project after college. Uh, I already had done a, a number of renovations and had some employees of my own on small projects and had an estimating business. And then uh, I did some financial feasibility, real estate things, a senior thesis, University of Texas, Austin, helped me get a job with developers. So I was a project manager and director of, uh, uh, and had influence over the designs of these buildings, but trapezoidal shape shells. The cruciform is a, well-known Frank Lloyd Wright uh, design. You can see in the floor plan. Irregular forms. This is in China. Uh, tower is a form in itself. This is in Venice, Italy. Uh, one of the places I'd like to return quite a bit. Towers. This is Philip Johnson. 
very well known, modernist and postmodernist. This is uh, revisited this village, Philip Johnson uh, uh, design in this 2020. Crystal Cathedral. You can see uh, from there the cathedral, the irregular form of the cathedral and the tower next to it. It was actually built, the tower was actually built later um, <clears throat> by, by Johnson also, but he didn't have it in the original design. And then what you see to the to the left of that is a Neustra design, which we'll see one image of. Neustra is a very famous Austrian architect in California, practicing California, came to California. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Shanghai Tower in China. See the shell there, twisted shell. Uh, here's shells and corresponding building heights that go with each of those. See on the bottom the different shell uh, cross sections. Uh, this is the Neustra um, project I referred to next to the Crystal Cathedral. It was actually a commission, the commission Neustra uh, um, to build this, and it's as an, somewhat of an addition uh, with uh, small galleries and a botanical garden and its own tower, clock tower. I was talking about shells, and this is transformation of form, dimensional transformation of form. If you speak of form, magnifying the horizontal. This is a famous Roby House in Chicago on the University of Chicago campus. Uh, this is something my son Joseph. You see on his website, his portfolio, JJWIV. So he's inspired first long ago, he was 12 years old, made the Minecraft model, and then later on made these architectural models, and preliminary studios, and then uh, inspired this design you see here as one of the uh, was Town College campus design uh, competitions. More of similar forms, transformation of form, this is in Phoenix, Arizona again, 2020. Sun, sunset, <clears throat> beautiful sunsets in Arizona. This was at Christmas time, so it was not hot at all. Uh, the vernacular influence of the, the cultural and architectural vernacular uh, is existing architectural language of uh, an area on the forms that are created. So, you know, the vernacular of the area influences this is Shinto, Shinto Shrine, uh, Torah, Toro, uh, Torah um, Gateway to the Spiritual World, Tori, I believe. Uh, then this is the shells that of the uh, it's like a Buddhist monastery. The Buddhist monastery have Shinto shrines. Uh, um, I speak about this a little bit in the Frank Lloyd Wright lecture series, the difference between Buddhism and Shintoism, and uh, how that influenced Frank Lloyd Wright in ways, and Taoism too, which is uh, actually from China, but it, uh, worked its way into Japan and then had some influence on uh, Froebel methods, Froebel in kindergarten and in the blocks, his mother used a Froebel method. So uh, there's a history there. Uh, this is me. More shell. This is my project, recent project of old Pennsylvania farmhouse. Just additive form shell couple different design options I made models considering I ruled out the first one because of just bumping up the attic with a big shed dormer uh, but that was too cramped for the headroom plus the, the heating and cooling are difficult in an attic space like that especially in a farmhouse you can see I was attempt, attempting to make it a little more livable but the headspace really eliminated it <clears throat> Uh, and then, so we need more space, first model. And then this model, a little bigger, so we decided to build this. 
Uh, then my son later on made these models, first in Minecraft and then in Revit. And there it is, uh, shell finished. Uh, here's more shell transformation of form subtractive. So you subtract a volume out, it creates an entrance in the shell, in the form. And same here. Now this is Project California. After I moved to California from Texas, I already had experience in development and an architectural engineering degree. And so I became director of projects with uh, seven projects. This was my biggest one for this development company subtractive form uh, and this was the uh, courtyard and you can see here that uh, the subtractive nature of the shell form and also that the courtyard was the idea was it was cracked open if you see the on the left the two buildings that make up the complex on the right was a speculative office building on the left was a computer company light manufacturing and office space combined. This is in uh, Arizona now, 2020. This is uh, kind of a subtractive slice out of the middle of the building, creating this interior atrium. Well, this is the undergraduate architecture studios, but one of them, they have many undergraduates. Uh, this is one of the, the nicer studio. This is the graduate students uh, up above, with bigger windows. Uh, more subtractive now. This was my barn, or what it looked like originally. I uh, knocked out the side, make a porch, then uh, built the structure reinforced. Opened up the views of the surrounding farmland. It's a dairy farm of 100 acres and a 200 acre Amish farm just adjacent to it. Out here, uh, everything you can see there that corn is plowed with a mule team, Amish. So you see. In the uh, background, the additive form, the shell of the uh, house that I've expanded, and then in the foreground, the barn with this attractive shell. And this picture is just for fun of my daughter helping out. shell structure in Sydney, Australia. Free-formed shells. Frank Gehry is known for that. Uh, this is the structural engineering for that, which you could imagine is a lot more complicated than if it's just uh, cubic form. study here uh, at Stanford. Now we want to start speaking of this shell as an envelope, uh, an envelope to uh, create a environment and uh, protect the inhabitants. Is a curtain wall it does not carry any load and uh, the structure the way the structure is made is such that all the load is distributed and carried vertically down through columns and other places so the exterior wall is free to be a curtain of glass so we're just speaking of an envelope now. The shell is an envelope, and so it uh, helps maintain an environment. And uh, 
you can see here some of the uh, environmental sustainable design aspects of the building and this shell. And so now here's my lecture notes from another class. Oh, well, actually it might be in the class that you're in right now. Uh, it is in the class you're in right now, but this is a textbook I've used in uh, another course than where I'm initi initially making this lecture. Uh, so this is from uh, this Heating, Cooling, and Lighting book. And this is the Thermal Envelope. So what you see here, and I, I won't go into all the details, I, I want to go through these lectures quickly so that uh, if you view them on YouTube or wherever you're looking at them, you can go through and then decide to come back later. Uh, if you're looking at it on YouTube, you don't have uh, some of the links, although you can slow it down. Uh, I'll put a PDF into the comments below the YouTube video so you can have clickable links. So this is the thermal envelope for heat gain. So the idea in the envelope is you want to stop heat transfer. And um, you can see that uh, uh, you have um, a lot of uh, variables here. Now you don't always want to stop the heat transfer. You might want to you know, make use of some of the heat that is generated inside. You also may want to use the heat from the sun to warm a thermal mass. So it depends what you what time of the year it is and how you feel about air conditioning or heating, or what climate you're in, what region you're in. Uh, but we're speaking of heat gain here now, and what you do with that depends on your circumstances. And so this is an equation for that. And I won't go into all the variables here, but you can see that heat gain is a function of a number of things. Um, and the, you know, the R values, the resistivity of the wall, and how much wall area there is, of course, surface area and the roof, and the, and the floor also. Um, and you have times this DETD factor, which is a design equivalent temperature difference. And that's a function of uh, the change in uh, temperature through the walls of, or roof section, the, the mass of the mass of the of the, the building, and then this albedo, which is reflectance of both visible and infrared radiation. So depending on how you paint things or what color the natural color of the material uh, and reflectance that factors in. So continuing with heat gain, now we want to look at heat gain through windows. And so we have the area of the window, and then we have a, a solar heat gain factor. And that's a function of where the, uh, the, the sun is, so the latitude that you're at, uh, the window orientation of the sun, the season, the time of day, and then um, a solar heat gain coefficient, which is function of the shading, so uh, the glazing, the type of glazing, the uh, shading strategies, uh, trees, uh, this whole chapter in this book would cover um, in either in, uh, well, wherever we are covering chapter nine, there's a whole chapter on that in lecture notes. And so here's an example. Um, so we have a, a double glazed window, four by five uh, foot uh, window. 80% glass uh, on a wall facing south in a building located at 40 degrees north latitude. Uh, the time is 11 a.m. on March 21st using tables from reference books. So ASHRAE, American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, is pretty much the standard uh, throughout the world, um, typically, certainly in, Amer in America, in the United States, um, its fundamentals. Also, the AIA, American Institute of Architecture Standards, I have uh, here also referenced. So you can find these um, based on the given uh, data of so many BTUs, British thermal units per hour, uh, heat uh, uh, per square foot. And then um, uh, you have the solar heat, 
gain coefficient of 0.73 uh, that you find from the uh, it's in this course textbook also you can find it other places then you have your glass area and so you're multiplying um, the, uh, the uh, uh, area of your window by this only 80 only 80 percent of it is glass so you have 16 square feet and then the heat gain through the window is uh, plugging into this formula uh, to get so many BTUs per hour of uh, heat gain through the window. And what you want to consider now is the trade-off because you want sunlight, uh, you want a certain amount of sunlight you don't want glare. If you have a studio, art studio, architecture studio, typically you have your windows on the northern face, uh, even though that's going to be where there's a lot of heat loss. You get the best light because you don't have glare with the sun trekking through the sky and making you know, direct contact with your surfaces that you're in your studio. So you don't have to worry about controlling the shades uh, for, for light. <clears throat> However, um, there's a trade-off here you want to consider between heat gain and light. So um, this is how you do it. So you have the uh, visible transmittance, the VT, and then you have here a table of single glazing, double glazing, you know, two pieces of glass, uh, whether or not you're tinting it or not. You have triple glaze clear, double glaze clear, low E, um, and there's different ways of doing that with coatings and with uh, argon filled gas. You can put different gas inside. Um, uh, so, you know, there are different things you can do uh, to get different uh, qualities. And so you, you have here your, your visible transmittances, how much light gets through. Uh, the heat gain is the heat, so heat gain is SHGC. And then you have a ratio between the two. And then you have what you normally find is an R value, your resistivity, and, and it's also uh, the, the U value uh, sometimes is referred to. It's just one over the R. So again, this is what you're looking at. It's letting visible light in, but blocking heat. Presumably that's what you want to do. I'm most familiar with this in hot climates where you want to keep the heat from getting in the building because you're worrying about cooling in these large curtain walls in Texas and California. That was certainly a concern. <clears throat> so now heat loss. So now we're previously looking at um, you know, the, the heat gain coming through a window in the last uh, slide and a trade-off with light versus the heat gain coming in. Uh, whether you want that gain or not depends where you are. In your super cold climate, you want to have the sun help heat up the building. But uh, in summer months, in a hot climate or anywhere, or, you know, it's a trade-off. But now we're talking about heat loss. So now we're talking about um, presumably keeping the heat in the house. And you want to have... Uh, an envelope, a shell, an envelope, a thermal envelope that uh, keeps keeps uh, the heat in. So we see now here one, two, three, four, five, six different ways that the heat can get out. Uh, some of it's through direct thermal conductivity. Some of it's going out with uh, airflow through vents and cracks, and you know, cold air coming in also is a, a problem for heat loss. Um, and so a similar formula uh, for heat loss through walls, windows, doors, and roofs. You have the area, uh, something to one over R, which is sum of all the R values, and then times the, the temperature difference. That's the difference, the delta T is the difference between the inside and outside air. So you have a thermal gradient across the section of wall. Now here's a wall section so you can see the calculations here with um, uh, a vapor barrier, gypsum board, and these are the correct architectural symbols. Um, 
three quarter inch airspace, which has an R value, and a rigid board, plywood, outdoor air film. Actually, air has a very good insulating quality if you can keep it in a uh, keep it sealed. Um, <clears throat> the problem is where things it, it flows and then the heat is lost that way. And so you, you see all the things in this section, and uh, that adds up to one uh, R value for the whole wall section. So now we want to consider the uh, uh, R value, the R sub T means thermal uh, resi resistivity. The R value of 5.95 that we just got, uh, we just calculated on that previous uh, wall section, um, how we could improve that. Uh, and in there, there wasn't any insulation in the three and a half uh, inch uh, air gap. Uh, I, you know, two by four is uh, one and a half by three and a half inches. You know, the actual dimensions of a two by four. So you have a three and a half inch air gap. Um, even though air it does have some insulating value, you can see in this graph here that it doesn't really have uh, any more of an R value after three quarters of an inch. So um, uh, you want to perhaps put something else in there. You definitely do want to put something else in here. There. So um, this is the uh, a table now um, that shows the R value per inch of different types of insulation. So if you're in, in Africa or in a third world country where you don't have uh, uh, the, all the manufactured materials to use for insulation, you just put straw in there perhaps, and that has a 1.5 R value per inch. If you blow in fiberglass or wool, uh, that's 2.5. Bats, the big roll, the pink stuff that you see, sometimes it's white, paper faced or foil back, that's 3.5 of the R value per inch. And then expanding foam is the best. That's a little more expensive, it can be a little messy. Uh, you normally don't want to try that yourself. Um, you can buy little cans just to fill the cracks, but if you do it on a large scale, um, you need to rent some equipment or hire a professional to do it, but you're going to get a better R value of 4.5. Um, so we could improve our R sub T of that wall section from 5.95 to, depending what we use, uh, anywhere from uh, you know, 1.5 per inch to 4.5 per inch. So we're multiplying by 3.5 and we get you know, the improvement, the actually you know, the additional R value uh, of quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> and if we want more, well, then we need to make the wall thicker, which it actually is why you see now two by sixes use it in construction in a lot of locations. Um, if you're in a colder climate, uh, some places it's now mandatory depending where you are. And uh, so you switch to two by sixes. Now you have a one and a half by five and a half. That's the actual dimensions. And so you have more space to put more insulation and you can increase from anywhere from 8.5 to, or 8.25 to 24.75. You can increase the R value that much. Um, and then here is a table uh, from our uh, textbook you see here uh, of what is recommended for different parts of the country. Sometimes it's mandated by code. Um, and so you see Pennsylvania, uh, it's, it's pretty high. Now you say, oh, Arizona, why do you need to worry about that? Well, it actually gets very cold in the desert at nighttime. Uh, and also, you know, this insulation is also blocking the heat from getting into the building too, as, uh, during the daytime. So um, you know, our value works both ways. Uh, and Florida is a little bit less doesn't have that it has the, all the humidity that keeps the heat in um, it's a little different so you see here's different recommendations and the basements too should be uh, insulated and then a link you can go to um, 
find uh, this kind of information. Um, and then uh, radiant barriers. Um, you can add a little bit to your uh, thermal resistivity, actually quite a bit, depending on uh, how you do it. And so these are uh, reflective kind of uh, barri barriers, um, typically. And then uh, just what your glass gives you. So uh, what, what kind of value you can expect out of glass. We've seen that in another table. And then <clears throat> now translucent panels. They're another thing that let uh, uh, a little bit of light in. Um, but you can get privacy with them uh, depending on what the what level of translucence you, you let uh, you specify. And you get some R value out of that. Uh, now this is just to show a couple more details here of uh, things you could do. And uh, uh, this shows wood here, which is typically residential construction in the United States is, is wood. Uh, and then metal, which is commercial construction, uh, referred to typically as commercial construction in the United States. And the problem with uh, a metal stud is you get this thermal bridging because metal will conduct heat very well. And so you don't want your heat escaping your house in the, uh, in the winter time or heat coming in in the summertime. Now we want to control airflow also. Um, typically, you would want to stop the airflow in uh, winter or, or uh, summertime if you're trying to control artificially, artificial control with uh, HVAC system of some sort. Uh, but you may actually want to let it flow if you're doing uh, some kind of uh, passive cooling, which we may talk about here in a minute. So uh, you put infiltration barriers up to stop the flow. Also put weather stripping around the doors. Uh, you put a, the, around the foundation, a sill sealer, big roll of foam, typically blue kind of thing. Uh, on the top of the concrete block before you put your, uh, your bottom plate, your sill plate that you build your wood up from if it's wood construction. Um, air barriers, uh, building wrap, Tyvek you see uh, you see wrapped around the buildings. That's a air barrier, building wrap. Also, in uh, you see this in cities quite a bit, in high rises, certainly in Chicago, places with high winds. You have uh, air locks, so you have a set of double doors, and that keeps the the, the air their inside climate uh, controlled better not just flowing in and out, lose all your heat out of the building, or perhaps gain heat <clears throat> when you don't want it. Uh, and then revolving door does the same kind of thing. There's airlocks are three different ways to stop air infiltration. Here's a table for stopping air infiltration uh, through the wall. And so, <clears throat> um, or roof, and it's interesting to note that um, the residential grade of building wrap does not um, meet certain standards, um, certain recommended standards, as well as you'll see the, the other uh, highlighted things of roofing felt or uh, some of the obvious things like fiber bat insulation is not going to stop airflow by itself. Now, vapor is something else, and that can vary by climate, actually, even where you put the vapor barrier. And so uh, when you're putting this in a wall, this is stopping moisture from traveling through the wall. And um, 
you can see highlighted here, it says vapor permeance um, of common building materials. Values approximately may vary between products and different manufacturers. Class designations according to the uh, International Building Code criteria, IBC, and explained in the accompanying text, you can look in the textbook. Uh, material and shaded rows have permeance too high to be considered vapor retarders. So um, you want to look at some of those. Um, and then in this other diagram here, uh, in a cold climate wall assembly, the vapor retarder is located close to the interior side of the wall, directly under the wallboard, the sheetrock, uh, where it limits the uh, diffusion of water vapor from the warm interior toward the cooler, drier exterior. So you want to think about where you put that depending on what climate you're in. Now some basic uh, physics of air movement, the aerodynamics of uh, controlling airflow, and then uh, using it to your benefit uh, for passive heating and cooling. Uh, you can have evaporative uh, cooling, just when you, the wind blows over you on a hot day and cools you off. And it takes off, takes the moisture and the heat, takes the heat away. Um, and also fresh air, which is becoming more and more important these days. So the physics of air movement to air is, um, is, is a, it's like a fluid. Aerodynamics is different than fluid mechanics, though, because air is compressible and liquid water is not. So we talk about uh, the flow of air and uh, it ca it's caused by uh, the delta pressure, that's a change in pressure, um, or convection currents that are created because of a change in, or because of a change in temperature. So yes, you have pressure differentials where you see, uh, you can see that on weather maps sometimes when uh, high winds are being created, there's a, a pressure gradient, change of pressure from one area to the other. Um, and you get wind because of that also just a change in temperature will create convection currents so you get a flow of air because of change in temperature the two ways that wind can be created and then there's types of flow so laminar flow is where things just flow uh, pretty evenly uh, without turbulence and that's a little easier to do calculations around when you have turbulent flow it's a little more tricky to uh, do with fluid mechanics calculations. So there's types of flow, laminar, turbulent, then you have eddies where things are just spinning in a circle or just completely separate air flows. And then you see down um, below that the roof pitches and slopes so, uh, around shapes and what you see are the pluses and minuses of a positive pressure or a negative pressure like a vacuum, you know, less lesser pressure and with the air flowing over buildings, uh, depending on the pitch of the roof or you know, from a flat roof to a pitched roof, you can control uh, the air pressure. Also, uh, and those, those are elevations, so, and you're looking at the slope of the different roofs. Then looking at building footprints um, and how the air flows around a building with you know, the plus making pressure, or you even see eddies in the one case in the middle, um, and how the air will flow around. And, the, and there's a, for ventilation, a best and an okay and a worst. So maybe you want the air going through your building. You might very well want it to go through if you're trying to do passive heating and cooling, or ventilate, uh, just get clean air exchange. Uh, if it's in a barn, get you know, really clean, get the smells out or just if you have uh, diseases and things and uh, you want to clear out the air with just opening the windows. It'll take a little more than that in most cases, but uh, it certainly wouldn't hurt to have fresh air more. Um, also, uh, a flow equals a function of adjacent buildings, terrain, where the prevailing wind's coming from, and certain weather anomalies, you know, a tornado come by, that's gonna change the wind flow. Then on the right here, uh, another uh, 
thing to look at is um, velocity, the delta v. That's a vector, the change in velocity that you get. Uh, if you constrict a pipe, it will increase the velocity in that section of pipe. That's called the Bernoulli effect, Bernoulli. Uh, if you put a little, little uh, hole uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in connected to that constricted part of pipe, it will suck air in, create a negative pressure. That's called a Venturi effect. So here's how you use, uh, below there, how you use a Venturi effect to ventilate. Uh, with prevailing wind and a you know pressure or a, a velocity profile of increasing velocity as you go higher, which can happen definitely, um, and then how you might want to ventilate. So ventilating is very important. It's also important for getting moisture out of attics so it doesn't rot your wood and, uh, and getting smells out of buildings in general. But certainly ventilating your attic is a very important thing in most climates anywhere. Um, and so this shows bottom figures, soffit vents, and the way to do that of uh, having air. You put these little vents. I've done that a number of ways. There's little circle ones you can put in and square ones. And you can do it just by the way you build your soffits, too. Uh, and then a ridge vent um, is one way to do it and have the air flow out like you see in the picture. Here's a case study of the Pantheon in Rome, uh, it's, uh, 2,000 years old, and uh, it's, it's an amazing structure to, to visit. It has natural daylighting just through the front door and the oculus, which is a big hole in the ceiling, the top of the dome, intentionally built. Um, it has natural daylighting effects, uh, 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 benefits, but also um, cooling, uh, natural cooling effect. It creates um, uh, this convection currents that are created, and that makes a natural circulation um, uh, for evaporative cooling, blowing all you know on your skin, cool you off, and the heat rises and exits out the oculus hole, as you see. Here's a uh, serious concern for fresh air uh, at the moment. While well, I'm recording this during the corona pandemic, where school has gone on online, mandated everywhere in the United States. Um, and so this is a New England Journal of Medicine article on the coronavirus and how long it will last on different surfaces and in aerosol form. So uh, you want to consider how to handle the airflow, um, presumably get it out of, uh, or get the virus that's in aerosol form uh, out and away from people. Uh, getting fresh air is a good way to do it. That's why uh, being outside is a very good idea and why places like New York City with high rises and everybody live, going up and down in elevators and, and mass transit and subways and in close proximity to each other uh, during colder times also in closed buildings, closed climate controlled buildings. Um, it's created, had it's added to a big problem for the New York City area right at the moment. So um, <clears throat> you want to consider this, uh, how long it lasts in aerosol form. So what you see in this chart here is comparing it um, so you know, the, the coronavirus is more, you know, COVID-19 is more specifically referred to as SARS-CoV-2 uh, and comparing it to COV-1. And SARS is uh, the respiratory syndrome um, that uh, is associated with the, the illness and death that goes with it. And so they're showing here that it can last for you know, three hours or more, certainly uh, in aerosol form, and potentially get into the uh, HVAC systems. Although you know, at the moment I'm finding conflicting articles on that, but this, what I'll show you next, 
This is uh, a memo, a letter written from the director of the world's most respected air conditioning, uh, the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Uh, I think most people would agree, including in other countries, uh, maybe not, but uh, it's certainly respected here with uh, you know, 192 chapters in, in 132 countries. 57,000 members, and even if you're not a member, you're obeying the rules typically here. It's implemented in the codes and the, uh, the standards that people use. Uh, these are this. They do develop the standards that people use. So uh, you can come back and read this, uh, and you know perhaps you're looking at this, uh, uh, you know, not in 2020 when it's happening, but who knows? This will be on the internet on my YouTube channel, and a thousand years from now, this will be a historic note people just jump over because uh, it's been cured or something's happened. But you see the things they're spelling out here uh, very specifically, um, operable windows, uh, proper ventilation, and you know, health care facilities certainly, um, specific uh, requirements there, and uh, their position just on infectious diseases in general airborne, air and aerosol form. And then you can go to their website, the bottom, link at the bottom of the page, um, and they're stating pretty much that transmission through the air is sufficiently likely. Initially, when the virus came out, people were saying it really was just like projectile uh, spit from somebody sneezing and would go right to a surface. But later, uh, everybody's adjusted that, revised that to it can be an aerosol form. The study certainly shows it, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. And um, read more if you like. Control the dissemination of infectious aerosols. Now, water penetration. So. Roofs, water blowing in different, all different ways, uh, needs to be controlled. So you need some kind of, uh, uh, it's going to create mold or wood rot or just get everything wet in your house, get you wet. So you want to uh, control the transport of water, and uh, it's a fluid flow. So uh, you know, gutters flashing is the metal. Uh, that you put uh, in, in the joints uh, between materials uh, to keep water out. There's actually a counter flashing too uh, that keeps the water from going up under the flashing. Uh, weep holes that you put in the cavity walls behind brick facades to let the water uh, come when it comes down in the cavity back behind the bricks, it weeps out little holes. Um, then, so that's for direct fluid control. You want vapor control also, uh, venting the air, which we spoke about, uh, through the walls and the roofs with vapor barrier, we spoke about. Um, and I won't read all these things here, but you can go down and look through all the different ways you can stop water. We'll come back and we'll take a look at this. Uh, here's some more mention of these kinds of things, putting a name to it, a barrier wall, mass wall, it actually takes in the water and then it uh, evaporates off. Or if you have some kind of drained cladding, that's like with the uh, weep holes that I mentioned behind the brick. Um, some general principles of how water moves through a wall or uh, down a wall and uh, see the saw cut or cast a drip uh, so water will wrap around underneath a surface surface and travel in if you put a little uh, cast it or cut it in with a saw um, it, the water will break its flow right there and drip off so water water is a big problem you want to keep the water out of out of the building, so stop water penetration. 
And so here's different types of roofs. These are built up roofs. And you can come back and look at the specifics of those. There's two different kinds of built up roofs with uh, rigid insulation. But you know, first down, you put asphalt down. I'll show in the next diagram. Uh, so here's built up roof, uh, tar, tar and gravel typically, hot big vat of uh, molten tar uh, versus modified bitumen, different. Um, it's a Palmer product. So, so we take a look at those different types of hot applied roofing materials. Also, you, you'll hear about membrane roofing. We used to refer to this as Elastomeric. I haven't heard that recently, but uh, when they first came out, and were new, they were elast called Elastomeric. So it's different rubberized roofing materials. It's a giant membrane, membrane roofing. Uh, so these are rubber materials that you glue together. So you don't need a big hot molten vat of tar. And you can look at those details. Come back. Wood shingles is another way of doing it. Roofing. Uh, this is very common in the United States. Uh, three tab shingles, asphalt shingles. Uh, Usually works pretty good. In Texas, it wasn't always the best choice because it gets blistering hot. Uh, Arizona probably don't want it at all. It's even hotter there. Uh, well, I actually saw some, I believe, but you would do a clay tile or something else there that could withstand the heat. Like this, clay tiles. It's going to be more expensive, but common in the hot areas. This was common in Texas. I uh, wrote specifications for a roof. Uh, this one uh, had an estimating business, and one of the roofers wanted me to. Uh, they were doing sheet metal roofing, so I made working drawings, working drawings for them. Texas standing seam metal roofs were common at that time, 35 years ago in Texas, or from when I'm recording this in 2020. Uh, green roofs. So this is a this is a newer thing to do. Now this can be very problematic because uh, you know the, the water is not shedding off of the roof, you, and it, there's weight considerations here. Plus the roots can dig the if you plant things that the roots that are too strong. Roots are very powerful. Can dig their way through the roof. Uh, so this can be very problematic. But if you can make it work and you pay the initial cost, it's a beautiful thing. It's an environmental thing to do. It's also some natural natural uh, insulation. Now here's something uh, that's an assignment in one of the studio classes from uh, a couple of years ago you might want to look at that uh, made for uh, uh, making some very specific uh, uh, recommendations for the contractors and you know, legally binding uh, a contract and specification, the specification, but to go with the working drawings. And so you come back and take a look at this if you like. Uh, there's some details here. Also, you look at the construction specifier institute divisions. Uh, back when I first started learning 40 years ago about architectural engineering, 41 years ago, is that right? Yeah. I started college in 1979, architectural engineering. These are the 16 divisions that we worked by for many years, or it seemed like many years, uh, until you know, more recently. This is what is presently used, and uh, you know, 50, 49 divisions. Um, but it's you know very specific where to find things. And then here's a sample specification. I'm not going to go through this now, but for a green roof. So just to look at the details here. Now, this is a legal document. So, you know, not only the engineer, you typically don't get an attorney to look over all this. A lot of it is considered boilerplate. So it's like you use the same specifications over and over again, or you just modify them a little bit. That's what we did, uh, what I did um, when I was in the building industry. So working for developers for some years and then uh, in a, professional engineering 
consulting firm in the San Francisco Bay Area, put together big specifications, and um, it's you know very specific. And typically, you want the engineer who's most knowledge knowledgeable in certain fields to do the specification. This is just for a roof, and so you look at all the details here. Uh, Again, this is somewhat standardized, so you can reuse or just slightly modify existing specifications or that you find. Uh, you see the referral to all the uh, ASTM, American Society of Testing uh, materials, uh, standards that people refer to all the time, not just in the United States, it's a, it's a standard uh, many places. And so you could see quite a bit of detail about every aspect of what's going into this roof. Um, a little bit about the execution. All kinds of details, insulation, flashing, crack treatment, expansion joints, protection course. Again, come back to this if you want to read the details need to read the details uh, more more details to look at and the contractor needs to read this and when they bid on it this is a legal binding thing when they make a bid it's based on the drawings and these specifications quite often very more the specifications than the drawing drawings can be a little vague sometimes but the specifications are usually not and it's a legal binding document And uh, so the end of this specification. Now we want to talk more about the, uh, the shell, the walls of the shell. And this is Shanghai Tower, which has a double walled system creating a whole environment in between the walls. Uh, as you can see here in a section of the floor plan. Now we want to talk about glass in general. Uh, that was a curtain wall we were looking at there previously. And so here's the process for glass. Uh, it's always going to be big flat sheets now and, and milled uh, rolling stock. You see on rollers, um, it's like steel is rolling stock now. And so uh, it's rolled out. You, know, you can see in the first diagram how it's made and then rolled out and cut um, and then there's a table of a glass thickness designation and common applications they used to make curved glass long ago you could or that would cat was cast originally which meant you could you could possibly curve it but i, I haven't seen curved glass in buildings and uh, i saw them in san francisco and some of the old victorians uh, but it was rare, even when I lived there and for a couple years uh, in the late 1980s. Now, when you specify glass for certain kinds of uh, applications, other than just uh, a window that's out of the way, some place that isn't dangerous. If you if you have uh, operable windows uh, or doors, glass doors, uh, sliding glass doors, or shower doors, you need you need tempered glass. And tempered glass uh, is used for strength, but also breakage safety. Um, so it'll crumble into just little tiny pieces, not shards. Little tiny, not sharp pieces, instead of very sharp shards of glass that can cut you then also laminated glass now so you uh, uh, it, it it's structural uh, as well as for safety um, often have a uh, thin film of plastic laminated between the glass so that it won't uh, shatter at all most cases but uh, you can see that it, if you're gonna have glass steps then you imagine you can imagine you need something a little more 
sturdy. And here is a project uh, that I was the director of, project director, and head of the design team, and engineering team, uh, that included purchasing uh, $600,000 of uh, Ford Blue Reflective Glass in California. It was a brand new thing at the time, and it complemented very nicely with the color of the uh, concrete, the salmon color. And here are some windows, uh, glass windows. And so you should be familiar with what a fixed window versus double hung uh, versus slider versus a Casement window, I uh, like. And the parts of a window, you should know what a sill is. An apron, a sash, exterior casing, jam, stool. And this is the table just comparing different uh, U factors. Um, <clears throat> it's just 1 over R, which is the thermal resistivity. And some different doors, um, how they work, how they operate. Uh, swinging, bifold, accordion, pocket door bypass door, surface sliding door, those are handy. And here are a selection of different kinds of wood doors and steel doors. And here we have a uh, table for fire ratings of uh, doors. As you know, or probably know, uh, they're rated for the hours it takes to burn through. And so a door, uh, you know, a, a means of egress and, uh, for firefighters to get in and a way for people to get out of the building um, is a critical architectural element. And the fire rating is, is critical. Now, walls and ceilings and uh, other other things have fire ratings also, but uh, for doors, that's particularly critical. And you can go to this link here for many more architectural projects of uh, Elizabeth Town College students. Uh, what are shown here? Just some highlights. You can see many more on this website at this link.